Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the leaflet. We have today with us Professor G. Mohan Gopal, a former director of the National Law School of India University, Bangalore, and a former director of the National Judicial Academy, a very renowned scholar. He recently wrote a very thought provoking piece after the death of activist Jan Swami in which he made some very interesting and innovative points. And basically, he asked for the review, an independent review of the role of courts in Father Stan Swami's death. Dr. Gopal, I'd like to start with a point that you make in your article, which I believe nobody has made, which is uh, narrative independence. What do you mean by narrative independence? Do you mean that the courts often get swayed by the public narrative or even the narrative built by the government when dealing with cases involving allegations of terrorism? No, I, I, I think, um, uh, let me start by uh, uh, reflecting a, 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 for a minute on what is a narrative. Right? So there is a whole field called narrative psychology. And there's a famous quotation from one of the thinkers in that field which says the world is not made of atoms and molecules. The world is made of stories. And so uh, narratives are very fundamental to the way in which we understand the world and relate to the world at an individual level, as individuals, as groups, as institutions, our uh, perspectives are shaped by narratives, right? So, um, so that there is a narrative is, is an is an as essential a part of humanity as it, as it is to breathe and, um, and unavoidable. The question is, what is the narrative? And are we critical about the narratives that control and influence us as human beings? That's the first point. The second point is the law as a discipline is actually a method of thinking about and interrogating narratives and making sure that narratives are actually grounded on facts. And the Evidence Acts very beautifully describes facts as things or a state of things or a relationship between things that are perceptible by the senses or a mental condition of which we can be conscious, which means that it, 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 the law provides a, a, a requirement as a matter of discipline that we must question whether the narratives are based upon things that are perceptible by our senses, verified by going through the exercise of saying, okay, who has perceived this fact? Not who imagines this fact or speculates this fact. So what is not perceptible by the senses, such as suspicion, uh, you know, speculation, superstition, um, is not ab admissible in court as, uh, as a fact and therefore cannot be the basis of legal decisions. And therefore we have two things. One is we have narratives, which is a reality, a psychological reality and a social reality. And the other is we have a technology for making sure that these narratives are actually based on, on fact, meaning things that are perceptible by the senses or perceptible to others, which are objective. And the word objective actually comes from the word ob which is the same ob as in observe, right? a thing. And yective comes from what is in front of you. So objective means, a, which is a, objectivity is the heart of judging and the heart of the legal process. It is that you should only make decisions on ba uh, based on objects, on things that are perceptible to you and that are out independent of your subjective perception. Independent. Subjective is what is under your control. Objective is not what, what is not under your control, not manufactured by you. So you take all this together. We have narratives and we have a technology called law to protect us from narratives, from false narratives, because that's a big risk to us that false narratives are constructed. So against this background, what is happening all over the world is that uh, the, 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 you know, that one party or another and the other, perhaps, in court um, 
presence narratives saying this person must be sent to jail or no, no, I'm completely innocent. I've done nothing wrong. These are all narratives. So how does a court uh, find its way forward in the midst of these conflicting narratives by focusing on facts and, and evidence? And those facts must be not facts which are not under the control of the judge or the court. That's, then it's subjective. When you, if it is under you, the, what you observe is under you, under your control, because then you can shape it the way that you want it. Whereas uh, if it is objective, it's outside you, then it is something that you have to take as you perceive it, rather than something you can control. Therefore, the uh, starting point is to say that we must be independent of narratives using the, the methods and technologies given to us by law. Now, the best illustration of that is... Uh, something I referred to in that piece, which is a very, very tough case, a case uh, which I think is uh, similar to involving terrorism, allegations of terrorism, accusations of terrorism, of the worst variety in the sense of uh, involved, uh, you know, uh, associated with the murderous attack on the World Trade Center in which thousands of people died. In, in, this is a case called Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, where uh, there is a... Um, a, 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 an associate of, uh, of Osama bin Laden, no less, direct associate, a part of his team who is being tried. And the narrative of the George Bush administration is that this man is a very dangerous man and he has killed people he, or he has been associated with killing people. He will do that again. And so just as John Paul Stevens, who is writing this judgment, judge of the U.S. Supreme Court, he is no more with us. But at the point he wrote this judgment in 2006, he had already been a judge of the United States Supreme Court, not other courts, just of that United States Supreme Court for 37 years, for 37 years, just a judge of the U.S. Supreme Court. So you can, you can hardly imagine a judge with greater experience of at the highest level, the apex court of a country than him. And then he writes something which I write in the article, and I'll just take one second, if you permit me, to, to quote it, because that will answer your question. Just as John Paul Stevens writes, we have assumed, as we must, that the allegations made in the government's charged again, a charge against Hamdan are true. So he says, look, I accept your narrative as true. We have assumed, moreover, the truth of the message implicit in that charge, namely that Hamdan is a dangerous individual whose beliefs, if acted upon, would cause great harm and even death to innocent civilians and who would act upon those beliefs if given the opportunity. It bears emphasizing, uh, well, let's, that next is a, is a procedural point, but in undertaking to try Hamdan, and subject him to criminal punishment, the executive is bound to comply with the rule of law that prevails in this jurisdiction. This is a declaration of narrative independence. I'm not questioning your narrative, he says. I accept your narrative. But the rule of law has to be independent of a narrative. It can only be based on facts, not on narratives or stories. Now, this is a, the background to it. What we are facing in our own country is basically uh, unquestioned narratives which are reinforced in the media, which are reinforced in, in the public consciousness that feed into the fears of the people. And I'm sure there are elements of truth in, this, in the narrative sometimes. I'm not, I'm not examining that. But ultimately, these narratives are painting Stan Swami who's the man whose life has been a, a pub, you know, an open book for his entire life um, and various others uh, as the George Bush administration did as terrorists. The, 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 yeah, uh, you uh, quoted from this case called Hamdan versus Rumsfeld. This reminds me of a movie I recently watched, uh, Moditarian. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's a very interesting movie, again, based on uh, a similar case where um, Salahi, uh, a Mauritanian national, he is uh, kept in confinement in Guantanamo Bay for almost 14 years before released. Uh, there, uh, 
a lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer called Nancy Hollander, played by Jodie Foster. She makes a very interesting point. She says that I'm not just defending Salahi, I'm defending the rule of law. The constitution, she says, does not come with an asterisk at the end, which says terms and conditions apply. So in, in that case, I just uh, to take this conversation forward in that case as well, uh, he was acquitted and the US District Court Judge uh, James Robertson, he said, uh, Salahi may well have been an Al-Qaeda sympathizer, but the government has failed to adduce evidence to show that he was part of the Al-Qaeda's command structure and he was acquitted. Now, that's a very brave judgment. Now, you talked about uh, Hamdan, I spoke about uh, Salahi judgment. Recently, Delhi High Court also gave a very brave judgment while granting bail to a couple of student activists. And immediately there was a pushback and there was a backlash. And one would say that there was also a pushback by the Supreme Court of India, which uh, almost stayed the, the operative part of the judgment, uh, barring the fact that uh, the accused were allowed to be out on bail. Now, while it is one thing to say that there should be narrative independence, but it is entirely another thing when the judges in their individual capacity or sometimes you know, part, acting as a part of the bench, they do uphold narrative independence and they are faced with this backlash. So what do you have to say about that? Because uh, judges obviously are part of the same uh, system. How, how, do they, how do they cope up with this, with this kind of uh, you know, pushback by the, by the system and by sometimes by the society at large? Let me start by, uh, by uh, you know, re re recalling that uh, a, a very respected senior judge once took, uh, you know, gentle objection when uh, a reference was made to an honest judge. <clears throat> he said, "Look, uh, that is, you know, every judge has to be an, you know, every, every judge has to be honest, and you can talk about dishonest judges, but you should not." qualify a judge as an honest judge, because if he's a judge, he has to be honest, or he's dishonest and he's not a judge. So similarly, I, I, I recall that because when you said brave judge and brave judgments, right, there's nothing courageous. They are being, this is, they're being appointed and paid very handsomely and given lots of privileges and benefits and enormous power in order to uphold the rule of law. So there's nothing brave. It's the, it's, the, it's the first and most primary thing that a judge has to do is to understand and uphold the rule of law and be accountable for it. And, and, the, and what does the rule of law involve? It involves, one of the things it involves is basically to make sure that the standards and procedures laid down in the law are applied to reach determinations of courts and uninfluenced by powerful narratives that the state or the defense may, may mount in front of you. Uh, for example, that, you know, that this defendant is unimpeachable. I, I, I once sat in a district court in the country where uh, someone had been arrested for murdering, uh, for, for uh, the, the death of a, of a woman in his house, for murdering uh, her, who was a father-in-law. I don't know, remember the details, obviously. But uh, the defense narrative uh, which I heard myself sitting in that uh, uh, trial court um, asking for bail for this man. The court did not was not influenced by that uh, by that uh, narrative. But the narrative was, sir, he is a Hindu. A Hindu cannot uh, kill his uh, daughter-in-law. This was the narrative mounted by the defense, and the and the you know the judge maintained narrative independence and said so, so that's not relevant to to the question whether he's entitled to bail. So. I think, first of all, we must realize that we cannot lower the bar so much and say these are brave judgments. The Delhi High Court judgment is a correct judgment. It's a correct judgment, which um, interprets and understands the law correctly and painstakingly explains why it reached that decision based on law. It could not have reached any other decision. Right Now, the Supreme Court is yet to examine that judgment on the merits of the law. They've made some interim interim orders. The question that the, the issue is that it will not apply as a precedent. I'm not sure uh, what the legality of that of that. I, I've not seen the order on that. And if there is such an order, I'm not sure what the legality of that is because the principle of stare decisis, namely that it will bind the courts uh, within the jurisdiction that it has, uh, cannot be amended by a dictator of the of the Supreme Court in, in you know from the from the bench. 
it cannot be because it is it is really it is part of our uh, our non negotiable uh, non derogable values that uh, on the basis of which rule of law operates that when a high court or a supreme court uh, uh, lays down a, a judgment the ratio decedendi the ratio decedendi uh, is applicable to the courts uh, over which they are supposed to apply and so i think that raises lots of issues so yes there is a black backlash but the sad thing is there is a backlash against normal correct judging right and it is as if the narratives are trying to overwhelm the rule of law and and uh, and sweep aside the rule of law and the narratives must be the basis of judicial decision making so independence of this narrative as exemplified by two normal judgments not brave judgments one by justice john paul stevens and there are many others but as illustrations one by john paul stevens one by the the delhi high court are normal judgments that we expect from every single judge and uh, to be to be guided only by the processes of of judicial decision making laid down by legal principles and statutory provisions and and not be influenced by the narratives presented by either side and that is a, a very important element of judicial independence which we in our country in the current circumstances we really need to question very carefully whether uh, the narratives are getting uh, are, are in, coming in the way of the rule of law i believe they are in many cases from what one reads in the papers but it requires careful examination uh, taking this uh, thread of narrative independence forward uh you talked about hamdan's case uh, i spoke about salahi's case at least there was an assertion there by the government that they were part of the al qaeda network al qaeda uh, carried out terror attacks uh, including 911 which killed uh, hundreds and hundreds of innocent people also in the in the case of delhi riots there was violence and at least 50 people were killed but stan somi's case stand on a different footing because even if the narrative is taken on its face value the allegation is not that he triggered some riots the allegation is not that he uh, instigated some conspiracy which led to bomb blast the allegation was merely that his computer had certain communications or files which may uh, you know lead to the possibility that he was part of some wider network of mari sympathizers so it was kind of a very weak case in terms of a public narrative uh, which often the government builds against terror cases so in even in this case an 85 year old priest arrested on the basis of what would many call flimsy uh, evidence why were the courts so uh, cagey why were the courts so reluctant to grant him bail i want to ask you why th there was just complete which you call a uh, complete judicial abdication the former uh, delhi high court judge ap shah has also referred to a complete judicial failure why was there such complete judicial failure to even accord him bail no i i think we should uh, distinguish uh, two uh, two things one is uh, uh, the uh, the you know uh, the the evaluation of the material presented against uh, a particular individual let's say in this case father stan swami right uh, versus uh, assuming the assuming that the material is rich and abundant but fiction uh, rich and abundant fiction Are you, are you are not surely you are not suggesting that then there was a basis to deny him bail it is not the thickness or thinness of the fiction that should decide whether you get bail the question is how should you evaluate that evidence what are the judicial standards on evaluating that evidence because if you say that there was hardly any allegation against him i, I don't think any of us have i have not seen the actual you know the submission to the court the evidence or the charge uh, uh, that was given to the court and let's say you are right and it, it was very thin right but so are we suggesting to the government then that they should sort of use more imagination and creativity and and submit a thick set of uh, of uh, 
false facts against people and that would justify bail. No, we are not. So what we should really look at is what is the what is the rule of law required a court to do in in um, uh, deciding to de deprive someone's uh, de uh, deprive someone of his liberty and put him in jail. So we have the preambular assurance of liberty. We have uh, Article Twenty One that gives us the, the right to fundamental right to life and personal liberty. We have various elements of Article 19, the right to be able to speak without being arrested and thrown in jail as a result. That's a restraint on speech and expression. So we have multiple protections, which we now know are all integrated, mutually supportive. And there's an architecture of liberty and freedom in the constitution. And that is, uh, that is being attacked. Now the constitution sets out very clearly and specifically the, the grounds under which, uh, or authorizes a setting out of grounds under which liberty can be deprived. Uh, e equality cannot be, uh, no restrictions can be placed on, uh, on, on equality or dignity, but uh, on uh, restrictions, uh, reasonable restrictions on liberty can be provided. Now this happens at two levels. One is at the level of the law. Are the restrictions authorized by law reasonable or not, and do they fall within the permitted par parameters of restrictions or the requirement that there must be a just, fair, and reasonable pro process of deprivation of liberty as uh, required by Article 21 uh, and so on. Now, maybe a legislation like UAPA has, has uh, yeah, yeah, so far, so far passed muster, although I personally believe that it is unconstitutional, but uh, it, it has passed muster with the judiciary. It's not been declared unconstitutional. So that's one level. The second is when it is applied to the facts and circumstances of a case, when it is applied to an individual and there are specific allegations made against that individual, what is the responsibility of the individual court? So you're dealing with a statute that is not yet found to be unconstitutional. It's part of the law of the land. Does that mean that the statute then steps in in the place of the entire constitution and takes away all your constitutional rights and simply complying with that constitution is, is, is uh, sorry, with that statute in its, general, in its generality uh, guarantees protection of your constitutional rights? And am I, I mean, the clear answer in all our jurisprudence and all over the world is no, in fact, the opposite. It is in the, in the application of these laws and, and, and uh, to the particular case that the protection of the constitution, uh, in fact, it is only in those cases that the protection of the constitution actually applies and is relevant. Otherwise, it simply remains on paper. It's only when you are, you are uh, 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 detained that the, that the constitution, and constitution kicks in. And the statute even then cannot conflict with the constitution. So that's when Stan Swamy's rights under 21, the right to life and personal liberty under 19, uh, kicks in when UAPA is enforced, is not displaced by UAPA. And that includes his right to bail, flowing directly his right to, from his right to liberty under Article 21. And, and, uh, and his right to, uh, to speech and expression, to engage in activities, his right to association under, under Article 19. So the, the individual court, not only judge, but the lawyers who are handling his case must protect the constitution and, and subject the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the evidence or the charge before that to the constitutional test, not only the statutory test, the constitution is a constant presence everywhere, even in our private spaces. It is constantly there. When a woman stands up in the middle of, a, of the night at home and tells her husband, you will not beat me. Uh, and you, you know, uh, invoking the Protection of Women Against Domestic Violence Act, a very revolutionary and wonderful piece of law that uh, Madam Indra Jaising uh, um, uh, led uh, when it was introduced in this country. When a woman says that to her, uh, her husband, she's asserting a constitutional right, not only a, a right under the Protection of Women Against Domestic Violence Act. That's only a, a, a fleshing out how to protect those constitutional rights, not replacing them. And, and, and the constitution is a constant presence, protective presence in our life, we, our fundamental rights. 
and the judge is the guardian of that protective presence and the enforcer of that protective presence. So frankly, the quality of how many charges they had against Stan Swami is, is really much less relevant than the fact that they had no right uh, under the, uh, the to they, 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 these restrictions were unconstitutional and the UAPA must be read subject to the constitution. The constitution should not be read subject to UA, UAPA. The right to bail must be read subject to the constitution. The, uh, the, the constitution cannot be read subject to the UAPA right to, uh, right to bail. And that would be a very, I think, wrong and very short-sighted view of looking at the rights of people. And that's where the failure is taking place. The relationship between statutes and, and no, the constitution and the principles of law, what we call use cogents, peremptory norms, which are globally accepted as non-derogable and non-violable, including the rule of law. And uh, I want to say that actually the rule of law is, is what gives us protection from fear, from fear. And one of the most important causes of fear and terror is being ruled arbitrarily and subjectively by armed and powerful people who will engage in violence against you. And this is the great fear of most individuals. And so when you violate the rule of law, you are actually causing fear and terror in the minds of people. And that is itself, in itself, violation of the, of the rule of law uh, in itself must be seen as an act of creating terror. In other words, a terrorist act to, to create terror in the minds of people, because ultimately all these laws against ter terrorism are intended to protect the people from having to live in fear and terror. That is the real purpose, right? not just to protect the, the officials of the state. And so the protection of the rule of the violation of the rule of law is usually the first objective of terrorists. Destroy the constitution, destroy the rule of law. And the rule of law, violation of law, cannot be the basis of protecting law. So the issue, the Stan Swami issue, raises a very fundamental question: Was the rule of law breached? Was the constitution breached? That's what we want to know. Not simply whether the 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 charges were uh, were, were strong enough or not. We know the narrative, the public narrative against him was very strong. He was seen as like uh, you know he was painted as as some kind of mastermind behind uh, violent extremist activities. And that led, perhaps, may have contributed to the manner in which he was treated um, you know, in prison or his right to jail, uh, bail was, uh, was viewed and uh, the failure of the law to protect him. So, yes. Professor, I, I... Professor Gopal, the reason I pointed towards the perceived... Uh, sorry, the, the reason I pointed towards the perceived flimsiness or the perceived thinness of the charges or the evidence against Stan Swami is because I wanted to ask you a pointed question. Is it the UAPA and the stringent provisions of UAPA like section 43D5, uh, which makes bail, uh, unlike in general criminal trial, an exception and not the rule? Are these statutory provisions standing in the way of uh, courts higher courts or even the Supreme Court from letting people out on bail? It, uh, <clears throat> it, it takes you to the question of uh, uh, Justice Krishnaya's uh, famous uh, dictum, you know, bail, not jail. Now, why did he say that? He didn't anchor it on a particular statute or the, or the criminal procedure code. He anchored it on constitutional principles. The presumption is that uh, is that there is that bail should be given and uh, jail should be uh, required only in very exceptional circumstances. And even in the statute in section 41 of this criminal procedure code, there are the well-established principles on where, when custody is necessary. And they basically have to do with interference, the f interference in one form or the other with the judicial process and the trial process. Namely, person may escape, may flee, may interfere with the evidence, may put duress on the um, on the witnesses in some for or second ground so one ground is interference with the judicial process the second ground is protection protection of the of the accused himself or the person being kept in custody or the protection of someone else 
who may be in danger of this person is released. There can be no other ground to detain someone. It is not, the, the question is really uh, not only the right to bail, but real question for the, for the uh, judges at uh, 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 the court is, the state, the executive, the executive is demanding that restrictions be placed on the liberty of, any, of a citizen. Is this a permissible restriction or not under the law? And if it does not meet the standard of permissible restrictions, that person cannot be detained. And the principles of what is permissible restriction on liberty are, uh, you know, emanate, recognized. The em recognition of these principles emanate in the Constitution, not in the UAPA. And, and the UAPA must, can only be constitutional if it is read subject to these constitutional mandates and, and provisions. So if you look at that, one very big mistake on which, uh, which is happening routinely in our country, and I've written about this also, is the, is the idea of custodial interrogation, custodial interrogation. Many judgments also say that some custody is required so that the person can be interrogated. This is a blatant violation of the uh, constitutional right against self-incrimination. A person is not expected to help the case to build a case, uh, help the state to build a case against yourself. The state has to build a case against a person independent of that person. That is a right against self-incrimination. You are not obliged to help the case, uh, the, the, the prosecution build a case against yourself. And it is because that is seen as possible that you are tortured because you are seen as responsible to prove that the suspicions against you are right. And so you're forced sometimes to speak the untruth just to stop the pain of torture. And this torture includes putting you in jail. So I take the view, yes, there's a separate question. If you are in custody on grounds, these two broad sets of grounds that, are, that permit the state to be pe people in custody for protection and for protecting the judicial process, then the question is, can you be interrogated during your uh, custody for other uh, permitted grounds? And the, the courts have said, yes, you can. You can't say, look, because I'm in custody, I cannot be interrogated. That is not a, a, a violation of your right against self-incrimination. But with adequate, adequate safeguards, including no torture and so on, and no compulsion, no, uh, no testimonial compulsion, you can be interrogated. right? But can you be interrogated just for the purposes of questioning you so that you'd be brought under pressure, mental pressure, psychological pressure, you'll be humiliated in society so that you will then um, agree with the, with, the, with the police and the prosecution? That is unconstitutional and, and absolutely impermissible. It is only a basis for producing false evidence that is partly responsible for the large amount of acquittals that take place because they rest on uh, on, on evidence constructed um, out of the pain and suffering of people just to relieve themselves of torture of, uh, of one kind or the other. And ultimately, they don't stand up in court uh, because they, they, they are not based on, on a, a shred of objective evidence. So I think what we have to to, uh, to the question we have to frame is, does, did, the, does the, did the state in Stan Swami's case have a right to restrict, to place a restriction on his right to liberty, and the and the uh, and the answer is the state has uh, no. He was not a threat to the judicial process. He was not a threat to uh, engage in violence or or uh, in illegal activities against the state. They, you know, they had they have, to our knowledge, they have not produced any evidence of, of that or to interfere with uh, with uh, evidence with witnesses. And if that was a, a threat then, uh, uh, as has been said uh, in, in some judgments, appropriate conditions on, ba uh, on bail could have been imposed to, to guard against these, uh, these risks. But was, uh, therefore, there was no constitutionally permissible restriction, regardless of what UAPA may say or may not say, to place a, li a, a restriction on Stan Swamy's right uh, to liberty under Article 21. Sorry, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. Yeah, Professor Gopal, I want to ask you, has the higher judiciary, especially the Supreme Court of India, tied, up, tied itself up in knots by, on one hand, upholding the constitutionality 
of this extraordinary anti-terror laws like UAPA, TADA, POTA, National Security Act. And on the other hand, sometimes they try to fashion out remedies and judicial succor by like they did in the case of K. Najib when they said that right to speedy trial uh, under Article 21 uh, cannot be trumpeted by special provisions like, uh, uh, like UAPA. Is there a paradox here? Like as long as these statutes continue to be in, you know, be completely, uh, you know, valid, the the judiciary and the different courts will find very difficult to somehow strike a balance between the constitutional guarantees and what the state is trying to achieve by denying bail and by imposing uh, onerous conditions on people charged with uh, uh, anti-terror uh, law provisions. So the 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 question of uh, constitutionality of uh, statutes is not a new one. It's a perpetual question. It should be a perpetual question. We all, we have the right to challenge the constitutionality of legislation, and we will continue to do that. Uh, but that should not be mixed up with the question of uh, the uh, constitutional uh, protections continuing to be available for a. Uh, the impl in the implementation of a law that has not been found to be unconstitutional. Even if a law uh, has that, uh, which, is con which, is, which has not been struck down as being unconstitutional is applied. The constitutional protections are meant to apply only in the operation of the laws. So if you take the view that the constitutional protections are not independent sources of rights, regardless of the statutes, in particular instances, then basically you, you, you know, you're saying the constitution is meaningless. So we cannot rely only on de declaring the a statute constitutional at that macro level as our constitutional protection. And then we suddenly shift from being protected by the constitution to being protected by UAPA and its language. And this, I believe, is really a hangover of, 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 of our colonial uh, jurisprudence, where there was no right in the constitution. It was entirely statutory. If you take the 1935 Act, the 1919 Act, there was a judiciary. In the, in the, in the uh, 1935 Act, it consisted of the High Court and the Federal, federal Court. But there is no, there are no constitutional rights for people in the 1935 Act. So you are purely statutory in the, in the, in your judging. But but we must realize that the constitution applies in the sub sub statutory space, not in the supra statutory space. If, as far as the citizen is concerned, the supra statutory space is simply an argument between legislature and, and judiciary in terms of uh, is, is, is legislation we enacted constitutional or not. And lawyers, uh, uh, law, all, all of us have an active stake in that. But as far as the man on the, or the woman on the, on the street is concerned, it is in the sub statutory space that the constitution lives or dies in its application, in its application to protect us against sub sub statutory state action and that uh, is the focus. professor gopal that brings me to a larger question which is of the large number of under trials languishing in a in the jails of a country yeah. uh, in a conversation offline you referred that 67 percent of the total uh, prison inmates are under trials now that's a human tragedy of you know great proportions because all of these individuals uh, have families, have children, wives, uh, many of them would eventually get acquitted, but uh, after uh, a tremendous cost, after paying a tremendous cost. So every person who is in jail is in jail because somewhere the judiciary uh, has not uh, exercised its power to, to grant him bail or has failed to uphold the constitutional rights. In the article also, you mentioned that granting of bail uh, is a constitutional right or securing bill is a constitutional right and it's not an act of judicial grace. So I want you to further dwell upon the role of judiciary today, which I think is not 
stressed upon enough, especially because uh, it's a it's a closed system. Lawyers and and judges they are part of the same system. Uh, as a lawyer, one cannot be critical of the judiciary enough to bring the focus on the failure of the judges in upholding uh, constitutional rights. But I would like you to dwell upon this point that it. Once a person has been arrested after 24 hours, his liberty is not in the hands of the police. His liberty is in the hands of the judges and the judiciary. So where the, the, does the judiciary stand in terms of, you know, securing, uh, you know, freedom for a large number of people who get arrested uh, sometimes on wrong charges? No, I, I agree. When we, we, uh, we spoke just before the interview, what I, I said was that... Uh, I did say that 67% of the uh, inmates of India's prisons uh, are under trial. That's a very shameful statistic. And I refer to it as a humanitarian crisis, a humanitarian crisis, which is not getting the priority that it deserves. And there are some, a few, a, 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 relative, a very small number of people who've been in jail for over 10 years as under trials. And, um, and I think that is, that is something that can be easily solved. There are, there are some conundrums in law that are, are responsible for that uh, and uh, that, that need to be, that can be resolved through judicial interpretation. But I also said to you that every person in this country who was, who was in, uh, in those prisons for uh, pres prisons or is in custody for more than 24 hours has been put there by a judge. So we cannot blame the police. The police is only asking for detention but, uh, and custody. All these 67% of India's prison population are there. It's effectively, judges have put them there. They've decided that they will go to jail, that they will be in jail. Do they have the, uh, the, 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 the power to do that? Do they have the do they have the power to override the constitutional rights of people? Now, the answer is no. They don't have the rights to overcome the uh, the constitutional rights of people. And yes, they do have power to put someone in jail, but only and restrict their liberty, but only on the basis of grounds that are constitutionally defined and applied through legislation, not legislatively defined, excluding the constitution. So it is the responsibility of every trial court, every judge in every court to understand that their role is a primary role, is a role of defending constitutional rights. This was very beautifully explained in the 117th report of the Law Commission of India by the then chairman of the Law Commission of India, Justice D.A. Desai, Justice D.A. Desai, where he said, and I'm virtually quoting him from memory. Uh, it's, it's not in front of me, but it's, it's a word, almost uh, an accurate quote. He said the Indian judiciary faced an enormous challenge of transforming overnight upon, in, upon the enactment of the constitution from being in colonial times, an extension of the law and order missionary, an extension of the law and order missionary to becoming use his words, a sentinel on the key vive, a sentinel, a guard on the key vive means on the alert of the fundamental rights of, of private citizens. So suddenly overnight, to use the, the word that Justice Desai used, the judiciary was trained to being a defender of the powerful against the powerless, to becoming a defender of the powerless against the powerful, complete inversion of the role. And it is on that basis that he said, set up judicial academies to help judges make this transition. Credit to the judiciary, and I've been privileged to be a part of that effort. India has one of the, the, the best networks in the world of judicial academies and regular programs of judicial academies, and a lot of conversation that is taking place. That's very recent, it's the last, say, 15, 60 years or so that this has happened at the scale. But, and, and, but that conversation is important to bring about this transition. So you ask the right question, what is the role of the judiciary? The role of the judiciary is actually to uphold the rule of law and protect and safeguard the rights of the powerless against the powerful. Because from a physical point of view, there is no need for a judiciary. The state, the executive can arrest people can, you know, and put them in jail or kill them 
they have the physical means to do that. In any case, they are the ones who are physically arresting people and putting them in jail. They don't need a judiciary for that. So why do we have a judiciary? We have a judiciary simply to audit whether the state's actions are compliant with the, with the, with, with, uh, the Constitution or not, and whether they violate constitutional rights or not. It is this audit function. Uh, that uh, that and then if if the uh, the uh, unlike a mere auditor a, a guardian function once that audit shows that the constitution is violated and uh, constitutional rights are uh, are not being protected then they have to enforce those rights right that is their limited role and and the idea of rule of law and protection from arbitrary personal rule by individuals is a central part of the constitutional scheme uh, without which everything will collapse. And a central part of that is to make sure your determination is based on objective facts, not on, uh, on false narratives or exaggerated narratives, but on actual facts. And now I think we should perhaps, look, uh, perhaps turn to the uh, uh, question, which is what is the standard of facts necessary as part of your question on the role of, of judges to put someone in jail? What is the standard? I can't hear you. Before we do, uh, before we do that, Dr. Gopal, I'd like to, you know, bring the question of selective prosecution, a point that you again made in your article. Now, this is again an argu argument that I have not seen often been made yes. uh, by uh, either academic scholars or by lawyers. And you write that this is a threshold issue and should have been a threshold issue in the case of Father Stan Swami because you believe that he was uh, singled out for prosecution by the government to stop him from supporting poor tribals and a point that he himself made before the court. So you say in your article that this is the defense of selective prosecution, that the prosecution is vitiated because it is based on arbitrary or prohibited grounds and should have been dealt by the judiciary as a threshold issue because that could have meant just quashing the entire case. Now, there are many such cases, including the case of Delhi riots where student activists have been quote unquote framed. There are other cases where lawyers, scholars, academicians, they have been quote unquote framed in cases of sedition, other national security laws. Uh, so, and they have been time and again pressing that they have been they have been singled out because of their views. So you believe that the judiciary now should take these cases and decide the issue of selective and false prosecution as a threshold issue, and that, does the constitution permit that? Yes, uh, uh, I think that those are, are, are very very important issues. Uh, they are slightly dis distinct issues. Um, the issue of the jurisprudence of selective prosecution is, is quite well developed in, in other jurisdictions because it is a very big problem. And the, um, uh, the uh, selective pro prosecution uh, is actually uh, a crime uh, to prosecute someone on selective grounds for which the executive and the police should be held accountable. What is selective prosecution? It is when you, uh, there is prosecutorial discretion and that is legitimate. But when prosecutorial discretion is exercised in, uh, on grounds that are prohibited by the constitution or by the law, uh, such as race, such as political beliefs and ideology or, or uh, political opposition, then the entire, uh, entire, uh, 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 the entire prosecution fails and must be set aside. This is the judicial standard. The famous case on this is at 1886, a case in the U.S. Supreme Court called Yik Wo, Y-I-C-K-W-O, the Chinese uh, name, Yik Wo, uh, pertains to uh, the targeting of some Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, individuals for violating laws against uh, the operation of certain businesses in uh, in a, in, a, in, a, in, an Amer in New York, in, and and uh, so the prosecution was assailed on the ground that we've been singled out because we are Chinese. And um, uh, the, the, it, it is, in this very famous case, the, the US Supreme Court said that uh, if the law, even if the law appears to be uh, impartial 
uh, and fair on its face if the law is applied and administered by public authority with an evil eye and an unequal hand so as practically to make unjust and illegal discrimination between persons in similar circumstances material to their rights the denial of equal justice is within the prohibition of the constitution so this is a violation of article 14 you cannot ap apply the law with an evil eye and an unequal hand selecting people because of their political views their activities they are coming in the way of corporates taking over land these are not things that i said i i, I said these are these are uh, are claims made by stan swami in court i'm not saying that that that's true or not uh, but i'm saying stan swami made this claims that i am being treated i'm being singled out and those claims should have been uh, um, enforced now uh, should should have been evaluated now are these claims new to indian jurisprudence no because i can tell you without revealing the name without his permission because i don't have his permission when i wrote this an article on selective prosecution in a national newspaper i got a personal letter from one of india's top most most respected most experienced lawyers right and he wrote in that saying look i'm so happy to see the reference to yikwo after a long gap because he said this case yikwo was often cited by and then he named another very senior lawyer who's no longer around and said this so this was frequently cited and referred to in the early days of our republic in the supreme court which means that the supreme court and the judiciary was very alive to the risk of selective prosecution that is um, people being singled out for illegal and unconstitutional grounds for prosecution but somehow that's fallen by the wayside and prosecutorial discretion prosecutorial discretion is simply not being examined or questioned as a threshold issue there are uh, there the issue very rarely the issue of uh, false evidence or false prosecution is taken up after the trial is over and there an acquittal of these charges of charges are a prerequisite for that uh, for that um, uh, for that matter to be taken up whether someone was framed or falsely charged is only taken up now after acquittal is over by then many years have passed all the damage has been done and given that there are many cases where uh, uh, convictions are reversed on appeal it is also quite illusory because you're deprived of your right to protect yourself against false prosecution and framing simply because a court has wrongly acquitted you and it'll take another many years before you know that it was uh, a wrong acquittal so therefore what the standard uh, the legal standard rule of law standard requires the constitution requires is that any reasonable um, complaint uh, of false of selective prosecution selective prosecution uh, discriminatory prosecution must be examined as a threshold issue equally the charge of framing framing must be examined as a threshold issue because if the answer is yes a person is being selectively prosecuted yes a person is being framed with false charges then that prosecution has to fail that you cannot go on with a it's a it's a criminal waste of public resources to go on with a trial which is vitiated by selective prosecution or framing uh, it is a fraud on the on the, on the, on, the, on the public of this country so it must be taken up as a threshold issue and determined before the main trial uh, is uh, is taken up after being cleared of the doubt the suspicion on whether uh, the uh, the prosecution is acting uh, illegally uh, or not because uh, you know that is again what the constitution requires so this is an issue that has simply not been given the attention uh, that it deserves and uh, we are being uh, you know robbed of our rights so that why even the police the situation is such that today someone goes and 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 files a, makes a complaint to the police and the police writes it up as an fir making the most ridiculous ridiculous uh, charges like we saw when justice chandrachud released this uh, person that he posted something uh, in the social media and then a, a complaint was launched fir was uh, launched under na uh, national security law and for th uh, two odd months he was put in jail so now it seems like a police complaint a bare police complaint by any random person is enough to put you in jail and have charges against you and a trial against you and take away before you know it 15 20 25 years of your life when all of society thinks 
that you are some kind of criminal because you've got criminal charges against you. And then politicians make speeches saying, look, he is on bail. Even if he's on bail, he's, he's a, basically implying that he's a criminal. So this situation is completely, the rule of law has completely failed. We are put into the power of random people, the ability to initiate a prosecution against you by simply making a baseless, unsupported charge, which is then converted into an FIR, a, a case is lodged, and then there is no stopping this train until some court somewhere, if and when some court has the, uh, the, the sense of responsibility to acquit you of these charges. So yes, we must put the focus back on the responsibility of the judiciary to protect us against selective prosecution and against framing as threshold issues. And we must demand that and we must say that a failure to do this is a violation of the constitution and the violation of the rule of law. Uh, connected with these uh, twin issues of selective prosecution, false prosecution and... Uh, no, let's, 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 keep, let's keep this a selective prosecution and framing, let's say. They're all a, a part of, uh, you know, false prosecution as is linked to those things. But what we are really talking about is framing and selective prosecution as two distinct ideas. Yeah. Right. So connected to these twin issues is the recent disclosure that some of the Bhima Koregaon accused uh, were on illegal surveillance and their phones were perhaps compromised through a Pegasus spyware software, which was uh, only licensed to government entities, including government of India. Yes. Uh, do you think that further strengthens this argument that uh, many of these accused were um, politically targeted and were already on, on the watch list of the government? You know, they were through legal yes, I, I, you know, without doubt, without doubt, I, it does. And and the fact is that governments all over the world, uh, without it, probably any exception, engage in selective prosecution and engage in framing. Uh, and and uh, the question is, what? How do we protect ourselves against it? And who is responsible within the state to protect us against that? Or is that going to be? Uh, you know, reduced to a, 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 a subsidiary issue, uh, or will will the will the allegation that I am being framed get the priority that it got when Justice Ranjan Gogoi, as the sitting Chief Justice of India, said I am being framed? He called a, the the Chief Justice's court into session on a Saturday morning and basically said I am being framed. And what did the judiciary do? They immediately asked. One of the most respected, most respected um, former uh, justices of the Supreme Court, Justice A.K. Patnaik, to inquire into this. And um, was uh, uh, Justice Gogoi prosecuted for the, uh, for the complaints uh, made against him for his, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, for, for his uh, uh, alleged conduct uh, towards his uh, staff member? No, never happened. So the, a complaint was made, it never resulted in FIR, it never resulted in prosecution, and no one said, okay, if Justice Gogoi gets acquitted, then we will see whether his complaint of being framed uh, is, is good or not, right? And, 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 and uh, uh, but he, you know, th this was taken and, uh, very seriously by the judiciary, but this should be taken, uh, the selective prosecution, the charge that people are being singled out, and that we are seeing in this country, people who are speaking out for the poor, people who are speaking out for the, the defenseless, they are being singled out for prosecution. Let me also point out that selective prosecution does not have, does not rely on the fact that the prosecution charge is false or, 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 or wrong. For example, there is a man who, this is an actual, actual case in the United States, a, a, a racist policeman is uh, catching motorists for speeding. And it turns out that every single motorist he catches is African-American. Now, there is evidence that they were speeding. It's not that they were not speeding. They violated the law. But that entire prosecution, is entire prosecution in its entirety is struck down because they say the state cannot act with racial prejudice. So even if you committed, the, uh, committed a, 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 a wrong, a legal wrong, the, you cannot be prosecuted on the basis of uh, prohibited grounds such as racism or political enmity or political rivalry, because then what will happen is that uh, the state will wait for you to make a mistake, target you, wait for you to make a mistake, 
and then produce the evidence and put you away. And what is in danger then is really the democracy and the rule of law. Because those who are violating the law are not being targeted and watched for violation of the law in an independent manner. Only those who the state don't uh, doesn't like the the executive doesn't like only they are being watched. Meanwhile, the other guys are committing crimes because they're not being watched because they're on the right political side or the right ideological side. They're not being watched. So what will happen is that rule of law and safety and security of the country is going to go down if the state is only focusing misusing the the uh, law enforcement to achieve its. Uh, illegal and prohibited aims, which is what is going on. All the time that has been spent in, in finding out uh, uh, tiny errors that may or may not have been done by political opponents, if that time had been spent actually tracking down uh, you know, terrorists, real terrorists or real uh, criminals um, you know, and, and protecting people, then you know, the law and order in this country would improve. And that is the purpose, of, that is why judiciary should protect selective prosecution. Well, protect us, sorry, should, sorry, I have to correct myself, should protect us against selective prosecution, or from selective prosecution. For example, there is no way to know, and perhaps uh, one day, I believe that some government comes and does an audit that uh, this spyware bought yeah. by the government of India, to what extent was it used for political surveillance and to what extent was it used for tackling uh, crime and terrorism. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, because uh, crimes are mounting. See, the, the, the crimes are mounting everywhere in the world. And there is, uh, you know, so, but as Justice Stephen said, within the framework of rule of law, which demands the fair and equal, not, not, not uh, criminal invigilation and prosecution with an evil eye, you know, as, as the U.S. Supreme Court very uh, evocatively said, but with an even hand, right, to protect all of us. Uh, I think that's what the judiciary is a corrective, an auditive, it has an auditive function. It should make sure that the state functions in accordance with the Constitution. And it should not be diversion of uh, uh, the energy, the resources, uh, the manpower, and the, and the overall state apparatus towards, uh, you know, malicious, false uh, po political prosecutions. Intended only to keep particular individuals or particular parties in power. Exactly. And, 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 and meanwhile, what is the price we are paying? The price is we can't sleep, uh, sleep uh, peacefully at night because there is no one watching out to make sure that the criminals are being, the genuine criminals or criminal gangs and mafias, including those who traffic women, those who, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, to, to do, uh, you know, most of these, uh, uh, those who, who commit incredibly depraved uh, crimes against the Dalits and, and, and uh, the minorities and, and the, uh, you know, marginalized people of this country, those are the people that should be watched so that the, the citizens of this country will be safe. So th there is a paradox where a state is getting mightier and mightier in terms of arming itself with uh, stronger laws. Uh, a very wide network of surveillance, uh, all the technology and, and machinery at its disposal to keep an eye on, on individual movements. On the other hand, the crime and acts of terror, they continue to surge. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gopal. It was, uh, yeah, you, want to, you wanted to add something. Yes. One thing I, I, I do want to say, yes. um, uh, and I, 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 just very quickly, just to put it on the, on the list, I think the big challenge here is how does the judiciary deal with uh, errors being uh, being made by judges of law, uh, which are not corrected or correctable on the judicial side through appeal and review processes? Because all systems, all systems in the world must have corrective mechanisms to guard themselves against judicial error. And error, judges are human beings. They, are, they don't make more errors than, than any other set of human beings, but they also don't make less errors than any other set of human beings. And the question is, we have to ask, uh, what are these mechanisms that are in place to ensure that the system guards against errors being made on the judicial side? And those are, uh, we have the Judges Inquiry Act, that's like a huge sledgehammer 
um, and it's very rarely used because it's also guided by, again, political considerations, not with an even hand. Um, and there is the internal pr procedures of the judiciary, which are very opaque and therefore have very little, uh, command very little public confidence. So I think this instance of Stan Swamy offers the judiciary, especially the Bombay High Court, an opportunity to offer the people at its own initiative, as it decides uh, uh, appropriately, a way to examine independently whether or not errors were made, and if so, how they should be corrected, um, not as, as, a, as a review of judicial action by the judiciary, because that's a separate issue, but simply as an institutional, institutional review of its own functioning. Um, and uh, set, uh, respecting fully judicial discretion and the, uh, the, uh, the independence of judicial decision making and not uh, substituting for judicial review. But some institutional review is necessary. And, uh, and I think, uh, I hope that uh, the, the Father Stan Swamy's uh, uh, death will not go in vain and will, uh, will result in, uh, in, in some you know, institutional innovation in protecting people against the judicial error in future. One, ho one hopes so, Dr. Gopal. Uh, ironically, just a day before yesterday, Bombay High Court made a remark, the same bench which was dealing with uh, Stan Swamy's bail applications, that they have immense respect for Stan Swamy's work, the work that he did for the tribals and for the poor and the disadvantaged. How ironical. How ironical. I wish. I, 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 I wish to be in a position where I can say for future Stan Swamis that I also say like the judges have, that I have enormous respect for the work of the judges on Stan Swami or, or, his, or future Stan Swamis. They should make sure that their work also commands from the heart uh, equal respect uh, from, the, from the citizens. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gopal, uh, for your very interesting and very innovative uh, views on the issue of rule of law, judicial independence, and constitutional guarantees. Um, that was Professor Mohan Gopal speaking to the leaflet. Uh, he crafted some very innovative arguments about selective prosecution being a threshold issue. He made some also very innovative arguments on judicial independence and also narrative independence, which is, which is so critical. Uh, these days uh, when we are dealing with the specter of authoritarian government and overuse and overreach of police powers. I hope that you enjoyed uh, watching Dr. Mohan Gopal's uh, and listening to his views. And um, uh, one hopes that th this debate continues and there is more spotlight uh, on the functioning of the judiciary and how judicial independence can be secured. Uh, through institutional means, through uh, self-correction means by the judiciary itself. Thank you.